they just said, do you want to come talk to Jose Andres? And I said, yeah. What else am I doing? Uh, we're talking about food diplomacy. I mean, yeah, my chef. What do you expect to find in my house? I have a baloney from two parts in California. Yeah. Mic check, one, two, three. Mic check. You laugh, you cry, you, you dream, you feel pain, you feel hope. Well, this interview just got very interesting very quickly. It's okay if I smoke a cigar or it looks bad. <laughs> Don't cool. Shall we do our thing? Are you okay? Okay, let's go. So thank you for doing this. It's a pleasure to talk to you. And uh, we're approaching a year. I mean, we're basically at a year of living in this pandemic. And I know you spent much of the year traveling and doing work with World Central Kitchen. But if you don't mind kind of walking us back to where, where you were a year ago and how it first dawned on you that this was something that was gonna change all of us for a long time. So, I am a cook that I'm always fascinated by, obviously my profession, feeding the few, feeding the many. But beyond that, also in emergencies, strange moments of, of humanity, I am always trying to learn the role that food plays. I think around the 6th of February is when the wall be becomes smaller when we get the phone call that is a cruise ship coming to Yokohama, Japan. And they were asking us to help them feeding uh, the first cruise ship with official COVID cases. That's what we did. That obviously followed with a very good response. Thousands of meals, three meals a day in a foreign country that we never really responded before yet. But we put into action our know-how, which is, we are a small organization, but it's created by chefs. Obviously, I'm one of them. And it's restaurants and chefs everywhere. So technically, we have no infrastructure anywhere, but then, in my eyes, we have infrastructure everywhere. Before we knew, we were tackling the issue in Japan, feeding people, keeping our team safe, keeping the people delivering the food safe, and keeping the people inside the cruise ship. Why we were the right organization to fight the pandemic through food? Because we handle moments in Haiti and Mozambique where cholera was an issue. And our teams always excel providing food, keeping every one of our teams safe, but keeping the camps and the and the places we were feeling safe. Why? Because we had good protocols. Simple, but good protocols. We were part of the solution, not becoming part of the problem. Because I think at the end, we are all learning that the pandemic is not the pandemic of the few, it's the pandemic of everybody. We need to see that it's not them versus us, it's we are one country, we are one planet, we are all together on this. World Central Kitchen, and you were working all over the world during this pandemic. When so many of us have been stuck in our homes, you all were out there doing the work, feeding people in all these different countries. And, and it's remarkable to think how you've built this organization. This was an idea you, your wife had had to start a food organization to think about how we feed ourselves, how, how we can feed other people. The earthquake in Haiti happens and all of a sudden that idea is put to the test very quickly. Can you talk about what you learned on that first mission and, and how you have built the organization based on those lessons? Uh, obviously the Haiti uh, of 2010 was the main reason why World Central Kitchen was created, but obviously we have to go be before. Uh, my wife very much was like, what are you waiting for? You know you love this thing. Don't, don't, Stop talking about the missed opportunities and just go and make them happen. But sometimes we talk too much, quite frankly, about food waste. What the heck about food waste? What about people waste? What about people feeling that they don't belong? The conversation is not about food waste anymore. The conversation is about the lives of people on planet Earth we are wasting. 
Stop talking about food waste. This is the wrong conversation. This must be a given. That should be the solution. It's like you say, oh, Jose, make a great dish today. Sure, I'm a good cook. Of sure, the least you can expect from me is making a good dish. The least you can expect from humanity is making sure that we don't waste food when we have hungry people. He wants to raise our collective expectations. Totally. We are bringing them down completely. So let's not waste people's life in our own communities. Forget about another country 5,000 miles away. So Robert Egger, I was 23, he told me, charity and philanthropy seems is about the redemption of the giver when philanthropy should be about the liberation of the receiver. There's nothing wrong that you give. And you should feel good about it. How do we value success on philanthropy? By lifting the lives of people up, by making real change in real time that you can see, you can touch, you can smell, you can sense. That's the only way to value return on investment in philanthropy. We've seen many moments that my profession, like September 11, that chefs came out in the streets and started feeding anybody that was in need of a plate of food. Random moments of empathy, beautiful moments of love and finding that solution. But what if we put all that together and we start making a powerful team of people that can have a very powerful response? Haiti, I went there not to help. I went there to learn. Ah. Obviously, I was feeding people and I fed thousands. But for me, it was not about who I was feeding, but unfortunately, it was in a good way I said, is about what I was learning. The, the problem when you look at International organizations, international aid organizations, they do a lot of very important work. But you know very well that they can be mired in bureaucracy. And money can get spent where it shouldn't be spent. And there can be waste. And, and in the end, people suffer because they're not getting what they actually need. In all your experience now, for all, all these years and over all these countries, how have you been able to avoid those missteps? Or have they happened? And how have you learned from them? Obviously, World Central Kitchen, we are far away from a perfect organization. In part because we are a new organization. We are a young organization. But we're good people that we try to learn. And we learn from organizations of the past, of mistakes of the past, but also of good efforts of the past. At the end of the day, we are really an emergency organization. And in emergencies, I only know that, quite frankly, it's not very complicated. Pure emergency means the emergency is now. The urgency of now is actually yesterday. And that if you don't provide food and water today, you're failing. On that, I think we've been highly successful. Obviously, we have many stories. When Haiti received what I believe was a great support from the Obama administration, but then we saw that the international community brought so much food. We brought so much rice from America and other countries that the rice producers of Haiti, nobody was buying from them anymore. We almost put them out of business. By the time the international aid kept coming, and Haiti didn't have the same rice production, and rice had to be imported, and rice all of the time was much more expensive than before the earthquake. There you saw the damage then the response to the humanitarian needs of a country, especially of a poor country, how they can have negative uh, connotations, influence, and repercussions. So, we all need to be learning from those moments. That's why for us, every time we go somewhere, as soon as we can, we try to buy from the local farmers. You saw us doing this in places like Guatemala. You saw us doing this in places like Venezuela. You saw us doing this in places like Colombia. You saw us doing this in places like Indonesia. This is very much on the DNA of World Central Kitchen. It's not what we claim, it's what we do. And I think this is putting us in a good path of good learning -ship, of lessons learned of what really works of what doesn't work, and hopefully make more of the good decisions of what really works. And as we grow, concentrate more on those areas that we know work for us, but more important for the people that we want to help. 
Even before the pandemic, people were fleeing countries that were beset by civil war, the ravages of climate change, or just looking for a better life, right? For, for them, for their families. And I know you've spent a lot of time with refugees, in particular in Colombia and Venezuela. And I just think back to what you said earlier, our need to kind of raise our collective expectations about taking care of one another. Can you just give us a sense of what you saw there with the people in those particular camps? So in Cucuta, in Colombia, we saw, in a way, sadness because people were leaving the places they were coming from. In a very bittersweet moment, at the same time, we were seeing hope because people were coming from such a dark place that they were moving into what we will call, hopefully, the light at the end of the tunnel. Even the light still seems very far away. But nonetheless, humans, we are all about light. Humans, we are not about darkness. Even in the most beautiful dark night, we love the beautiful stars or the moon lighting our way somewhere. And that's what I saw in Cucuta and Venezuela, that there is a lot of hope. But we need to make sure that that hope is supported. If not, even hope can get into darkness. And we cannot afford. This is not a moment to allow hope, especially a woman of young people go into darkness. We must be there keeping that little light abreast, that little light shining. And if we don't do that, we're failing as humanity. We are, we are totally failing. How do you do that for yourself? How do you keep focused on that light? Listen, in so many, so many moments in my life that I go to a place and. I try to keep going back and back and back to the same communities because obviously if you keep going back two or three weeks, doesn't mean you are part of the community, but to a degree I dream that I am part, becoming a little bit part of the community. And when I see especially children and especially young girls, I have three daughters on my own and I cannot tell you how, how fun I am of them three and how much wisdom they give me, even in the process of learning themselves. And when I see those young girls, like this little village, 30, 30 minutes, 45 minutes away from San Juan, a beautiful place, a village created over 100 years ago uh, of Afro-Americans that were hoping to find their own community to build. Um, and those two amazing smart girls, very young, probably eight, nine, that when I will get, uh, sometimes late, they will come, come on, Jose, come on, quick, 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 let's do the foot. They will always be on their bikes and quick, quick, quick. It's like, well, why are you so rushed today? And because, because we are hungry. When they told me we are hungry, they didn't mean they want their foot first. What these two girls told me when they were hungry meant that before they will eat, because they will never do it before, they had to serve the two, three hundred elderly homes in their community, which them two personally with two, three other friends will bring home to home. And this will take them over an hour to accomplish. And when they were rushing me, it's not because they were going to eat before. It's because they were so hungry that actually they wanted to make sure they will accomplish their mission before. And if I'm here for it, for those girls that I know they are everywhere, in Venezuela, in Colombia, in Guatemala, in, in Lebanon, in, Mos in Mozambique, in uh, you name it. I know that once you meet some of those people in some parts, almost I feel like those spirits are the same spirits that keep moving on around the planet. So here we are in this moment. And and I wonder if you see it as an opportunity that can be leveraged or lost. So we need to make sure that, that we take this opportunity of the lessons learned in the 2020 pandemic and beyond and see how we can really build a better world where food is at the heart, food is at the center, that people want our pity, people want our respect, 
that we should stop throwing money at the problem, but investing into the solutions. That if we have people that we're talking about the minimum wage, maybe that's the wrong conversation, but should be about what's the living wage. That we cannot have people working, that they are the working poor. If they're working, why are they poor? <laughs> if we are able to understand that the very big problems we face, they actually have very simple solutions. People are hungry, feed them. People are thirsty, bring them water. I think everybody will agree with that simple premise. So let's make that happen. Jeff, thank you very much for talking with us. It was a pleasure. Thank you.